everybody welcome to my youtube channel this is your girl butterfly um for those who have been following me for some for quite some time i know that it's been forever but i hope by the end of this video you will understand why i have been gone for a while <sighs> i won't deny that my heart is actually beating quite fast as i make this video um i had a birthday shoot today so um, my makeup artist Ali was saying that I shouldn't let the makeup go to waste um, I was telling her I would have made a YouTube video but I don't think I'm ready to be back um, she said I can upload it when I'm ready so probably by the time I do upload this I feel that it is time to tell my story or it's time for me to be able to share this with um, most of you that have followed me and have supported me and um, have just been sending me a lot of messages and inquiring about my well my whereabouts and just my well-being in general um maybe by the title of this video i'm still not sure what i'm going to title it so it'll probably be obvious already uh by now what this video is going to be about um but in case i don't title it um something very obvious uh, let me just say so i've been gone for a while it's been months i think the last video i made was um my son's first birthday so that's really 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 been maybe more than six months um i haven't uploaded since then because by the time of my son's birthday i actually found out i think by that time i just found out a month prior that we were expecting our second baby and um it was not a very easy journey i won't even lie i sorry this hair is irritating me uh sorry um it was not an easy journey it was not an easy pregnancy um i was always tired the fatigue was real um it also came at a time in my career where work was extremely extremely hectic uh one of our colleagues left the department so and then i think uh for like a week or so i was the only one in the department and it was just really not easy i remember i would be on i'll put an iv drip when i get to work for paracetamol um and also just for um, omeprazole just so that i can um relieve some of the pain that i was feeling because i couldn't eat i was having terrible food aversions um but then yeah i needed to go on with work because work was work and life was must, must go on and also then i didn't want to tell anyone that i was expecting and i also didn't want any pt to be quite honest so i didn't um share the news with uh the department i was just soldiering it on uh, my one colleague who i was working with um knew about it so but at the time that that week where it was very bad for me she was on mute so months went by um the excitement grew um i uh december uh, november was admitted because of um it's another i think there's preterm labor we thought it was preterm labor but then i was discharged and everything was fine um december came i was booked off again um I was having a lot of pelvic pain and pelvic diastasis. I think that's how you pronounce it. So whenever I would walk or move in bed, I was just in a lot of pain. Um, the pregnancy was just different compared to the first one with my son. Um, but the only thing that kept me going, I'm like, I really need to make it till the end to meet my child. And obviously the prayer at the time was that it to be a baby girl. And yeah, you know all that because we have a son, right? Um, yo. Okay, so uh, by the end of December, I think, yeah, somewhere mid-December to end of December, we were in the north with our family. Uh, we shared the news with most of, most of them. I mean, it was showing at the time. I think I was seven months at the time, so there was no way to hide it anyways. Um, and then we went to Swakop. Um, I was still very tired and I didn't even enjoy my time in Swakop. Um, and then I resumed work first week of January. I resumed work. Um, I was still just waiting for my appointment with a the doctor. Then I was really tired and I was in constant pain. Um, like in terms of now the walking and the pelvic pain, but then I still just held on. 
sometime um say early january maybe the 8th and 9th i was feeling some i started feeling a lot of back pain um i started feeling a lot of back pain i but at the time it it, it felt like I can't really say labor pain because I yeah I can't I haven't experienced that really, but I would say it's excru excruciating uh, back pain like period pain but worse than that, um but this was only happening at night so it wasn't alarming enough for me to say Elena stand up go to the doctor whatever I was just like you know what um my appointment is on the twentieth for the sauna so I'll wait that I'll wait for that so the purpose of the sauna was um for me to. For me to um sorry for me to for us to measure the scar because i wanted to do a trial of a trial of labor like i wanted to do a v back like vaginal birth after c-section right i wanted to have an actual birth this time and considering it was going to be an 18 month gap from my last c-section to the to this next birth um we were going to go ahead and proceed with that so the pain was getting worse at night um so I went, I decided to ask the doctor to move my appointment from the 25th to the 20th, which was the day of the sauna. But since they were fully booked, they decided, okay, let's squeeze you in in the morning and we'll change the sauna from the afternoon to the morning and then we'll get to see you. Because it's been quite some time since I've been to the doctor at the time because you know holidays and festive season and all that, people are closed and stuff. So come the 20th of January, um, I went in. Um, for my sauna, my routine sauna, um, <laughs> the sonography is usually talkative and we always have conversations, uh, medical and all that. But this time he was just quiet. I didn't understand then because um, I the first thing I saw and I was actually quite worried about it, but the first thing I saw was a fetal heart beat so i was like i was relieved because i'm like okay my child is alive and so what else could be wrong um and then he showed me like no um there's a lot of blood in the sack um this baby has to come out today so i lay there i didn't pack anything of mine um i was eight months pregnant or 34 weeks rather um my sister i had to immediately call her to send her money to go buy me um stuff for the hospital for the ba for the baby i had packed uh we had packed like just my son's baby stuff because i always just buy gender neutral stuff because you don't know what the gender is gonna be so but this time i had found out um just a few weeks not so long prior to that that it was gonna be a baby girl but i was just still like okay we'll still just pack the same stuff anyways because the yellow white green um because i didn't know what gender my son was gonna be so i bought gender neutral stuff i would have bought anyways even if i knew um so i called her um that was i think eight o'clock in the morning when the diagnosis was made that i was having a concealed placenta abruption so basically i my placenta detached i was bleeding um we had suspected that it was a, must have been going on for some time um possibly two weeks at that point considering the pain that i was having um the two weeks prior to that and i was still going on with my work i was even on call the day before that um but yeah so immediately they called the doctor my doctor was like no we need to rush to the hospital everything was happening so fast everything was a rush um they took me to theater and at nine in the morning i just remember that nine o'clock when i looked at the time i was already in theater um and then i remember the doctor saying to me that elena because he prayed with me he held my hand and he put his head on my forehead and he prayed with me and i remember him saying elena you making the change for your appointment that was not you as a doctor that was your intuition that was you as a christian that was you as a mother and it's that point i was still not worried because i mean ugh, like when he I asked the sonographer how big is the baby he said it's 2.75 kg the fetal heart rate was ranging between 134 140 so i'm like she's fine she can come out and the weight is good it's fine we let's just go and take the baby out at that point my tummy was so big like i even remember 
and we prayed to that i was walking to the theater i passed by these two security guards the women and then they're talking to each other they're saying apparently i'm carrying twins um it was that big honestly um so we went to theater um and at 9 23 on that friday morning we delivered our baby girl uh at that time one of my biggest worries was I just I didn't want to lose my womb because I could hear the conversations that were going on and I had lost a lot of blood. There were a lot of they were talking about a lot of clots and um this is con this is because of the fact that we suspect that the bleeding has been going on for some time. So they took my baby, I saw her and just when my husband was about to stand to go take pictures of her, which is what we did like with Adrian, the pediatrician told him no, he must just sit down. I waited and waited for that cry and it never came. I heard that I'm asking for the ETT and the UVC and, and the ETT is an endotracheal tube to intubate, but then obviously in the nose, yeah. And then the UVC to put in the umbilicus, um, the catheter for for the bloods or fluids or whatever that they're planning on giving her medication or whatever. And then um, at that time, I remember looking at my husband the only thing I said is, babe, we need to pray. He held my hand tightly and uh, it was, everything was so surreal. Whew. I'm not going to make up. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. Okay, so I was taken to, I was taken to the recovery room. Um, I remember I got, they gave me ketamine, like basically to just knock me out because I could hear the conversations and considering I'm a medical personnel, I could hear what was going on. So, but the ketamine didn't work. Um, the, my husband kept saying that, I kept saying, we need to pray, how's my baby, how's my baby, we need to pray. And you know, ketamine kind of makes you say things that are your innermost, deepest thoughts or feelings, I think. Um, I don't know, but yes, from the hospital, I've always told myself I don't want to be under ketamine ever because I was just like, I don't want to say things that I wouldn't want people to hear, people to know. But obviously, clearly, that was my biggest worry. How is my baby? Um, and then the only time I really realized that something is wrong or she's not okay is when I saw Prof. Pippa which is a neonatologist coming in when my pediatrician was already in. So I was just like, something is not okay. Um, but I saw her, they took her, I saw them take her to, in, they put her in the incubator. Um, I think that time they were still closing me up and then they took her to the NICU, to the neonatal ICU. Um, I, I went, um, I went to the recovery room. I lost a lot of blood, so they cross matched me. Um, they wanted to transfuse, and they would put up things to bring up my BP and just monitor me closely. Because at that point, I was also now a worry. Like I was also not in a a good state medically. I would say, but I was stable. I was I was stable. Let me not even underplay the blessing. I was stable. Um, so I kept asking the nurse that was taking care of me, um, how is my baby? And then she said, I remember she said, that's our baby. Then we're going to pray for her. We're going to pray for her. She'll be fine. I'm like, okay. So I went with the assurance to my room that my baby's going to be fine. Um, as how big she is, they said it's, she was 2.3 or 2.23. I can't remember anymore, but yeah. So I was like, ah, that's a good weight. I mean, we discharged kid babies from the hospital when they're 1.8 kg, so that's a good weight. The most I thought would be that she would need a bit of um, time um, in the ICU, maybe because of like lung maturity, whatever. They did give me a steroid injection, but I mean, it's just an hour. So we didn't expect that it would have worked so well, so fast then, despite the fact that she was already 34 weeks. I mean, you still just want to be on the safer side. Um, so we went to the room. I remember when I came out, I saw my cousin, she was also a doctor. Um, she came with us to the room. No, she went to my husband, to the ICU, to the baby. And then I went to the room. Uh, but then my sister was already called. So she didn't go buy the things for me for the hospital. So she rushed over to us. Um, I got there outside. I got in the room and I met, um, um, we call them Phil's um, Ventu parents. They're the ones that he's lived with for the 10 years of him being in Ventu. 
I saw them there. I feel like I had already called them. Um, they rushed to us, and then I was in the room. And I remember my cousin came in, my sister as well. And then I asked her, "How's the baby?" She said, "No, the vitals are stable." Um, I didn't ask. I knew she was intubated, so I just asked like um about the settings and things like that. And she saw us kind of let me say assured that the baby was gonna be okay or yeah fast forward to not really get into too many details um uh, the decision was made to baptize her um so the pastor came i think around two o'clock or two thirty she was baptized with her three names um and then um the the uh, doctor came in again i think it was only around one o'clock that i knew how critical she was when the doctor came to update us and then he came in again now later on after the baptism um past four i just know that it was sometime before five and he told us that the baby didn't make it so that is how we lost our baby girl uh I can't begin to explain to you the depth of pain that I felt and I still feel. And I don't even want to get into that because I don't want to not make it to the end of this video. But I do want to share that one thing that I have realized, I'm sorry for the sound of the cars that are, yeah, but one thing I, I do, rea I have realized and I've shared with my mom as well is that all the faith that I have been building for all these years of my life, I finally understand why. This is a time that I have needed it the most in my life. All the prayers that I've prayed, all the hopes that I've had, all the trust in God that I've ever had, this was the time that I needed to um, make it tangible make it more realistic for me there was nothing else i could hold on to but god there was nothing else i could believe in but god and it's a terrible terrible loss my husband and i are still grieving we are still mourning um we are still in pain every single day there's no day that goes by that i don't think of my baby but one thing I can say, and I've said it at the cemetery when we made the speech, at the cemetery when we made the speech, is that I do still believe that God is still good. Her first name means God is listening, and I still believe that God is still listening. I still believe that He will still restore our joy. Her um, third name means um, our joy. And at the time of giving that name, we were referring to her as our joy. But as time has gone by in the last two months, it's actually exactly two months since we've lost her. I have come to the conclusion more and more that God is our joy. And I know that he will keep restoring us, our joy, our faith. Um, I know a friend of mine says that I have restored her faith, renewed her faith through the strength that I have had and my reliance on God in this period. And I am happy that my, my daughter's memory won't go in vain, that I will hold on to God and through her and the loss of her, the many's faith will be renewed. My faith will be renewed. And if I have to share my story and my testimony with many more women that have endured the same loss and same pain that I've gone through, for us to honor God, I will do that. If I have to, to uplift God's name, even in this loss, for many to still believe in him, I will do that. I know it's a tragedy that um, a lot of people have gone through and some have lost their faith in, faith in the process and I don't even blame them. I don't blame them for being angry at God. I don't blame them for being sad. I don't blame them for losing their faith or losing hope um, because it's very easy to. I'm telling you being on that side, on this side, it's very easy to. But for whoever it is that I might be encouraging now, it's that better days I had. I know I still have not, I'm still not in those better days. I'm not even gonna lie to you and tell you here that I don't cry most days, that I don't miss her most days. <sighs> uh, 
I won't lie to you that I don't go through um, many stages of grief, um, including blame, I mean, self blame or guilt, um, denial, all those things. I don't go through those things. I do. But I can really, really say that I'm glad that my husband and I continued therapy. We started therapy exactly the day after the, the funeral. Um, because if I have to be honest, loss, this kind of loss, can also affect relationships, can affect marriages. Maybe one day I'll be able to talk more about that. But I can tell you that if it wasn't for us joining therapy together at the beginning, it would have driven a huge wedge between the two of us. Because one thing that stood out at the very beginning is that we didn't know how to comfort each other. And I think where I was at fault was, a part of me was, hoping to re to get strength from him or trying to rely on strength from him forgetting that this is his loss too he doesn't have that strength as well and um my therapist did remind us that we can be there for each other without putting the pressure on each other to make the other one strong in that moment we had to be open and honest with each other about what do you need in this time what can i do um how do you want me to console you how do you want me to comfort you um for if you need space let me know and it's not for me to take it personal so it's a lot that goes on when it comes to this kind of loss losing a child and i even shared when we came from the cemetery with a lot of my friends that one important thing about just choosing a partner especially when it comes to marriage is that when you make those vows for better or for worse since for, for in sickness and in health sometimes we don't realize that sickness becomes um becomes very early on in your marriage sometimes you don't know that your worst includes losing a child like in our story um we think of all the good things and we hope and pray for all the good things but the bad things do happen as well and i'm glad and i'm blessed to have the kind of partner that i have but most of all i'm also very very blessed to have my support system my friends my sister my mother oh, my father like Really, our parents, um, they all came down to Ventook. They were there immediately when I left the hospital. Our parents um, were there. Um, my husband's father couldn't make it, but his sister was always there, always, from the very first day, even before I got the news, before she passed, she was already with us in the hospital. His, his brother, our friends, honestly, the support system has been there and it's still there. And I'm so grateful. I've, I will never, ever take that for granted. When we went to the cemetery, um, my mother-in-law was asking if there was another funeral because the cars were a lot. The people were a lot. <laughs> But my mom was just like, ah, where am I? We show where I could say. And I just cried because the support was immense. I didn't even expect some of the people that I saw there. And this, and mind you, this was something that happened three days, four days after the funeral. I mean, four, four days after she passed. So some people didn't even know because most people were not even aware that I was expecting. So I was just like, imagine the number of people that would have showed up if it was an announcement that was made. Um, if I have to think of the number of, the amount of flowers that were in our house, the nurses even said my, house, my room was the Garden of Eden. There were so many flowers, so many people. The nurses, the support system in the hospital was immense because they didn't even, even the times that were not visiting ours, they never chased people out of my room. People would show up and even before they said they came to me, they would show them to my room because they just knew they came to me. That's how full my room always was. Um, I know the hardest day was the next day after she passed. I was woken up by a baby crying. I thought it was my baby. It, I guess naturally you would just think it's yours because, I mean, you gave birth. But it was actually a baby from the next room. They wanted to move me to another ward, but... Um, I didn't want to, the rapport that I created with the nurses in that ward was strong enough for me to stay there. So I didn't really want to create new relationships. This one knew me even from my last admission, from my last pregnancy as well. So I decided to just hold on to my faith and just stay. And the pain was also a lot compared to Adriel's time. So I do think there's, there's some sort of... Um, I guess power in when you have your baby that just 
removes the pain man of the c-section and everything um but because i didn't have her the pain just took a while even now i still feel the pain when i walk i still don't walk fast my husband says i have the penguin walk but i'm just trying to not walk fast because i'm in a lot of pain um but yeah just i know this video is probably longer than i had planned but that's my story um i i i yeah I really don't have i don't know what to say honestly um because the deeper i get into the actual story the whole story will probably make me cry and i don't want to break down and everything like that but whoever is going through this or has gone through it i just want to encourage you to please hold on to your faith hold on to god um the king of my heart is still the one that is has blessed me with the family that I have, the son that I have. If I never have any kids anymore, which I do pray to God that I do get, I'm still grateful for the opportunity to have birth to these two precious babies, even though one is no longer with us. I'm still, I'm very, very grateful for my son who gives me laughter and joy and just a reminder that God is still good. God is still great. God is still on the throne. He knew this, he knew my story before I was even born. And that's why I know that he has created things for me ahead. That no eye has seen, no ear has heard, all that the Lord has in store for those who love him. I think I'm quoting that wrong, I'm not sure. But yes, that's what I think it's first Corinthians twelve nine. You I haven't read that verse in a while. Or oh, second Corinthians. I'm probably saying it wrong. But anyways, I'll find it somewhere and I'll probably put it in the comment section. But yeah, so for those who've been asking where I've been and those who've been reaching out, that's why I've been MIA. I'm probably still going to be MIA for some time, but um, at least you know why. At least you understand why. Um, I'll probably share a bit of more of my story more as the months go by and the things that I've learned in this journey. Um, one thing that I've said in my last therapy session it's um i would say it's the holy spirit that came in my mind my heart when i went to church that sunday that's my first sunday in church since it happened on my first sunday this year um they were playing the song of trading my sorrows and before that they read um psalm 30 i think it was 12 to 13 and mostly most of us read know psalm 30 verse 5 um the joy comes in the morning you know but this one was 12 to 13 and um, I think it was something about trading in my clothes of sorrow for joy and all that. And I was like, I really felt like that Sunday was for me. And while I was sitting there, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me that I was just meant to be a vessel to carry her and to deliver her, but not to keep her. God needed her. God needed her more than I needed her here on earth and only he knows why i still don't understand why and i won't pretend that i do and that i will understand why but i know that all things work for the good of those who love the lord and are called according to his purpose and i know that my baby promise um we used to call her baby promise before she got her name because her verse was um his promises are yes and amen and that was and i always said and i said at her at her funeral in the speech that when we found out that we were expecting this baby our prayer was for us to get a baby girl but when we found that we were expecting a baby that was god's yes to us but now at the end of her life that was god's amen it is well it is done we still believe in him we still believe that in her few hours of life that she is going to serve a purpose in my life, in my family's life, in my friend's life, in those around me. And I will make sure, if it's my life's, my life's mission, to make sure that her memory doesn't go to waste, doesn't be, it's not gonna be in vain. And everything that I'm gonna do from here on is to honor that. And to make sure that I fulfill my dreams and the purpose for my life. And for those who remember that Adria was baby purpose, she was baby promise. So yeah. Thank you all for continuing to support me, um, for reaching out, um, for those I've replied to, those I haven't. I've really, really just been going through a really hard time. It was a difficult pregnancy and it's already, it's worse now. Um, I do say though that I will take 
everything that I went through in that pregnancy that I complained about that that was hard a hundred times over if it meant I could keep my baby girl but that wasn't God's um, decision our son's name is Harolai Naliwanife God's will be done and it's being manifested even more now it's being the name is coming out louder even now that this is God's will I do say that this is a cup that if it was up to me we will not take it but this is a cup that we've been given and because of that um we're gonna drink from it we'll keep drinking from it as bitter as it is we're gonna drink from it because god can relate god too lost his son he had a choice even to say that i'm not going to give up my child to this sinful world to die for your sins but he did and i'm grateful because i'm saved because of him giving up his son so i know that he can relate to what i'm going through um there's nothing there's nothing new to him there's nothing that is foreign to him that we are going through and now more than ever i believe that and i know that so yeah my faith has been renewed in this whole process as painful as it is i'm still gonna continue to rely on him and i pray that you do too whatever you are going through right now it's not a bad life it's just a bad day bad month bad year but it's not a bad life god still loves you he still chose you and all the challenges that you're going through right now god still knows your story and he still has good intended for you he still knows wants a future a prosperous future for you i believe that for myself i believe that for my family and yeah so i'm gonna end it there that she was our yes and the end of the life is our is her amen is the amen to her story but her memory shall go on we will tell her siblings about her and i pray that jesus tells her about us but yeah so thank you guys so much for and coming to the end of this video if you made it this far um do like to subscribe to share with whoever that you feel needs to hear this story and can be encouraged by it um whatever loss that you are going through i don't know many pains that are worse than this um i can say fortunately because i know that there are people that have probably gone through worse than this uh, maybe you have lost their whole family in fact or people that have lost the both the mother and the child at birth i know stories like that so i still say be encouraged um i'm still grateful that i'm still standing my mom keeps saying that uh, i'm grateful for that as painful as it was to hear then to be honest i always wanted to tell my mom like really can you not but i get it and i'm grateful that i'm still here to raise my little boy and to still be here as a daughter as a wife as a friend to those who love me yeah so do subscribe and until next time this is goodbye <sighs> okay um, i've made the decision that i will upload this on my birthday so today hopefully today is the day i do it it's my 30th birthday and i remember that saying that the only thing i wanted for my 30th birthday was my two kids and my husband and unfortunately um, we don't have the second child with us anymore, but in honor of her memory, I will upload this on my birthday. Um, yeah, I thought I will do it only when I feel ready, but um, I'm going to gather up the strength to upload it on my birthday and honor her. So yes, once again, thank you guys for subscribing, for liking, for sharing, for hopefully you will come back <laughs> to my channel and um i'll keep encouraging you and you know jeremiah 1 5 ne? it says um before you were born god knew you before you fight before you were formed in your mother's womb god knew you before you were born god set you apart i think that's it's a verse in my in the room of my children i say my children's room uh, it's on the wall i hope i'm saying it right but yes i am still the set apart butterfly and if this story is another reason why i'm set apart um to go through this to encourage somebody then i'll still take that upon myself because i believe that before i was born he did set me apart and for my children as well that's why i put in their room that they too are set apart so yeah 
see you guys next time